we're going to talk about challenges, where things can, can go wrong and um, how they can, uh, how we need to be thoughtful in handling them. Um, the, but before we do get started, I want to just take the opportunity once again to say how great it is for Stanford to have been able to host you all. But also I want to mention one person who you have not yet seen on this stage and who really is responsible for a tremendous amount of what has happened here. Um, you know, you heard from Jan Walczak the other day, um, who's the director of science for the Fetzer Franklin Fund. Uh, the gentleman you haven't met is Bruce Fetzer. This conference was his idea. It was his vision. Um, it, it was his enthusiasm about the idea of bringing you all together. If we have a party, people will come. Um, that, that, uh, that really made it happen. And so if you don't mind, since I think it won't happen at any other time, I'm going to ask you to join me in a round of applause to thank Bruce. So um, this panel is remarkable. Um, they are, in fact, all my heroes for how they've been thinking about science and doing science. And so I want to just give you a brief introduction to them. And then what, the way this is going to work is we're each going to tell um, stories for a few minutes and then have a kind of freewheeling discussion. Um, Lisa Feldman Barrett is University Distinguished Professor of Psychology at Northeastern University. She, uh, her, one of her books is How Emotions Are Made. And uh, I will tell you just this one fact to give you a sense of uh, the impact that she's had. Her TED Talk has had five million views. Um, Kathleen Voss is distinguished McKnight University professor in the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. Uh, one of her books is called The Handbook of Self-Regulation, and she is making a habit of being recognized as the recipient of the Thomson Reuters Highly Cited Research Award over and over again. Um, Norbert Schwartz is the provost professor of psychology and marketing at the University of Southern California. One of his books is called Thinking About Answers, the Application of Cognitive Processes to Survey Methodology. And among his many honors was his recent election to the European Academy of Humanities, Letters, Law, and Sciences, a very high honor. Um, and last, John Udell, who is an MD and PhD in immunology. He was a professor at the Winstar, Wistar Institute but for 25 years, uh, he has been at the National Institutes of Health. He's the lead of their cellular biology section. He runs a lab making important discoveries about viruses, uh, especially from my point of view, the flu. I expect him to protect us from the flu any minute now. Um, he makes a habit of publishing in Science, Nature, and Cell. He has 37,000 uh, citations of his work, and he lectures around the world to young scientists about how to manage their careers. He's published a book called How to Succeed in Science. And um, so they will each be telling you stories from their perspectives. Uh, and I'll tell you, since I'm not going to introduce people more, just a word about what John Udell is going to say. Uh, just for disclosure purposes, um, John is my cousin. <laughs> and. Um, we uh, see each other occasionally when I go to Washington. And at some point when the meta-science movement started, um, I, I took the opportunity over hamburgers to ask him what he thinks about the issues that we're grappling with. And he was quickly and immediately and emotionally open about how annoyed he is at this entire movement. And so I'm hoping <laughs> he's going to talk about that. Um, it's fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll hear that. Um, but before we do, I just want to tell a very quick story to pick up on a theme that Samin Vizier was talking about yesterday, having to do with trust. Because I think it's important for us to realize, in a sense, just how deep the problem is, and in a way that I think hasn't been, been illustrated. Um, this has to do with the 2000 US presidential election. You may remember that in the run-up to that election, there were lots of polls being done of American public opinion, and there were scientific surveys being done with truly random sampling of the American adult public by telephone that showed Hillary Clinton winning the popular vote. And that, no doubt, was a contributor to all of us going to sleep the night before the election, thinking that Hillary Clinton would be, in fact, elected president the next day. But there was one striking outlier. There was a series of surveys done, again, with true random sampling that showed instead Donald Trump winning the popular vote for months before the election. And the, this was puzzling to survey methodologists because uh, that survey should have worked. It should have agreed with the others. 
And quickly the hypothesis emerged that you may have heard called the shy Trump voter hypothesis. The idea that some people who were planning to vote for Donald Trump would be embarrassed to admit it to a telephone interviewer. And so this alternative survey methodology might have offered a superior method because it was self-administered by the internet. So people who, who might have been embarrassed to acknowledge their pro-Trump attitude over, over the telephone um, would comfortably acknowledge that online. So um, the campaign progresses, the same results are, come out, and of course, the day before the election, that final pre-election poll from that online survey also <clears throat> anticipated Donald Trump winning the popular vote. You may know he did not win the popular vote. In fact, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, and in fact, she won it by almost exactly the amount that the random sample telephone surveys anticipated, less than one percentage point of error for those random sample telephone surveys on average. So what went wrong with the online survey? And let me just tell you the punchline now. The punchline is that we are, this was a special case that rarely in social science do we have where we know the truth. So at that moment when we knew the truth, we knew which was right, which was wrong, we knew that sustaining the hypothesis that respondents were intentionally lying on the phone was no longer sustainable, that there had to be some other explanation. And so Matt Barrett, who's in this room today, has been leading an effort to investigate and understand what happened there and has actually discovered what happened. And this is, again, a lesson in best practices, that when he looked at the data set to see uh, what was maybe going wrong, he found that there was no base weight in the data. And when the inquiry was put to the group that collected the data, where's the base weight? They said, base weight? We have no base weight. So the question then was, OK, uh, how was the sample drawn in order to do the survey? Because a base weight is usually needed to correct for intentional unequal probability of selection. So here's what they did. They randomly sampled a set of zip codes from the country. And then they mailed 400 invitations to join their panel to at randomly selected addresses in each zip code. OK, there are a bunch of people in this room right now who are thinking, yeah, OK, what's the problem? And then there are a bunch of other people who are saying this. Because think about it for a second. There are some zip codes that are highly populated in dense urban areas and other zip codes in rural Nebraska where hardly anybody lives. And if you're mailing 400 invitations to every zip code, the probability that your household is gonna get an invitation is much higher in rural Nebraska than it is in Manhattan. So you need to know how many addresses there were in the zip code and correct for that unequal probability of selection. That's what the base weight is needed for. And that's what wasn't done. Now, what Matt has shown is that when you make that correction, those data come right into line with the telephone data and with the truth. That's great. And you could say, okay, victory. This is a story about transparency. That's what we need. We need to have the data archived. We need to have everything fully written up, including where the weights came from and how they were computed and how the sample was designed. No problem. But how many of you in this room would have just trusted that survey professionals collected the data. I'm sure they know what they're doing. Most of us, probably. Mm -hmm. So, in, and I certainly did. It never occurred to me that this might be what was going on. So it, it says something important there, but even more importantly, for those of us who are trying to find out whether some manipulation causes some outcome in psychology, when we don't actually have a benchmark of truth, how do we then know whether there are problems? So that strikes me as one of the biggest challenges that we face because, as you may have heard, over the last few days, there are some people who have said things like, replication, why would you want to replicate something? Because you already knew the finding. If you spend the resources to do it again and see the same thing, isn't that a waste of resources? So we need to think that through. I want to stop there and just leave it at that and illustrate for you the importance, I guess, number one, of careful attention to methodology, but number two, the challenge that I think we all have in the social and behavioral sciences where we often don't know the truth. How are we going to figure that out? Okay, thank you. So, Kathleen, you're next. Okay. Um, 
Uh, first, I want to add my thanks to the uh, Fetzer Franklin Fund and also to the organizers. This has been a, a rich uh, set of talks that were wide and varied, and um, the program has been, um, by all accounts, a wild success. So thanks to everybody uh, who participated, mm -hmm. and thanks for having me. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about a large-scale replication study that I conducted. I believe it is the largest replication study in all of psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and it is on a topic called ego depletion or self-control depletion. Uh, I want to give, um, I want to recognize Brandon Schmeichel, who's my second in command on this project uh, and a, a leader, just very great. So briefly, the idea that we were trying to test is uh, the notion that using self-control in an initial period then leads people to be worse at self-control in a subsequent period. It's a very sort of straightforward set of ideas and, again, goes under this moniker of ego depletion. Um, papers started coming out in support of that hypothesis in the 2000s, including many of my own, and, um, and they kept accumulating. By last count, uh, a 2018 paper by Malta Frieza reported that there are about 600 findings in the published literature that are supportive of the depletion model. About seven or eight years ago, though, there started to be some concerns about the published literature and about the evidentiary basis of the ego depletion phenomenon. Um, by the way, there's also theoretical challenges to the model, which the replication study that I conducted is just mute on. We have nothing to say about that. Um, and so it was sort of with this backdrop uh, that uh, my colleagues and I embarked on this large-scale replication. There have been some uh, other speakers here who've talked about large-scale replications and, and the topics that they studied and sort of discussing like how replications can be especially useful when there's a lot of controversy. Well, uh, there is indeed controversy about the evidentiary basis of ego depletion. A Twitter poll, obviously not super scientific, um, a Twitter poll of just three days ago of nearly 600 respondents asked people, uh, do you believe the depletion phenomenon is valid? 32% said yes, 36% said no, and 32% said undecided. So there's controversy for you. Um, there was a registered replication attempt of the ego depletion phenomenon in 2016-17 by an Australian psychologist called Martin Hager. I was not part of that. I was never queried about it. Um, and they used, uh, they found a zero effect. There was no effect overall. Um, and they used a methodology that was entirely computerized and not something that I would recommend. And this is a point to which I'll return later. Um, when the Hager replication attempt came out, I mean, people who work in depletion and who are proponents of it obviously took notice. Uh, and I think many of us thought there was perhaps a, a, a more appropriate way to go about it, one that tests the phenomenon in a way that more mirrors the evidence in the published literature. I decided to uh, take hold of the project and, um, and begin the replication. And just on a personal level, the reason that I did this is that uh, replication attempts and the interpretation of the findings, I just, I think they all too often kind of devolve into like he said, she said dynamics where proponents and skeptics largely maybe don't update their priors to use a certain language. And when I did this replication attempt, I did it so that I could say, I stand behind this no matter what. Um, so enter uh, the paradigmatic replication project. One thing that gets me really excited and it will remain the focus of my talk uh, today because this is a conference really largely about like the methods and the science of science. Um, I created a new model for doing replications. We call it the paradigmatic uh, replication attempt. Ours was a registered replication attempt, although not a registered report, per se, if that, if that distinction matters. And the reason that we uh, use this paradigmatic um, replication approach is because it has several advantages, I think, to existing models, and especially for ones, for concepts that are very rich and have a mature history like ego depletion. So briefly, what is it? The key idea behind the paradigmatic replication approach is that you don't take an existing single study from the literature and replicate that, but rather 
using a series of crowdsourced um, interactions and uh, brainstorming, you come up with ideas and, uh, and tasks, both for the independent variable and the dependent variable, that experts in that area agree are representative of the construct irrespective of whether they've ever been published together as an independent variable and dependent variable in the literature. So the tasks are based on uh, measures and manipulations that are published in the literature, but they are chosen for their fidelity to the construct. And in doing so, um, I think this has several advantages. One, ideally it shifts the attention away from you know, so what a given set of researchers did in a given study and what that found, and shifts it over to the evidentiary basis of the phenomenon itself. And I think that the replication, uh, replication attempts focusing on the phenomenon, at least for me, suits where I wanna be in terms of understanding the science of our science. Um, uh, let's see, as mentioned, this is very good for mature constructs where there is a large body of published literature, uh, and then you can choose um, from a menu of, of different options. The paradigmatic replication approach also uses several other features, a few of which we've heard about today, but um, we did so in a, a little bit more of a concentrated manner. We had three layers of crowdsourcing, and this is not just a methodological point, it kind of goes to some of the intentionality behind it, but in short, um, as mentioned, we get people who are uh, proponents and have largely worked in a given area, here again, the depletion area, to come up with these representative tasks, ones that they may have used in their laboratory. Crowdsourcing, of course, has a number of advantages just in terms of the quality of ideas. It may lead to higher quality ideas. But uh, in doing that and having the experts weigh in, ideally we get buy-in from people who have a vested interest in the way that this replication attempt is conducted and run. We also then uh, crowdsource with our participating labs. Once the experts had created a, a menu, in, in a sense, of different independent variables and dependent variables, we shifted over to the labs and we said, what do you think? And chiefly we were concerned with, is it even feasible to run this methodology in your laboratory? So for example, some methodologies may require um, that participants be videotaped because we wanna see you know, something about their facial expressions. And many laboratories said that that was not feasible for them. Um, and so the other thing that the laboratories did in this kind of crowdsourcing step is they also told us whether they think the tasks would be representative of the ego depletion construct in their labs because what makes something, you know, like a depletable task at Princeton or Stanford may not be the same for those at Minnesota or Florida State. And so we sort of did this benchmarking with our laboratories and also then got them to have more involvement and more buy-in. And the last way that we crowdsourced is we had an advisory team of statistical and open science experts, many of the names that you've seen in other talks here today, and they were invaluable in providing us support. They advised us on like the bleeding edge uh, replication practices. So for example, like, like blinding the dependent variable. They also informed us of the implications of some of our design and statistical choices, and that's just good to realize. They uh, helped us with the pre-registration and thinking through all of the different parameters and the conclusions that may follow from our results. Um, and last, they agreed to handle and analyze the data, and that was very important for us because being people who are central figures in the depletion published literature we really wanted to maintain a high level of integrity when it came to data handling, data management, and the analyses. And so neither Brandon Schmeichel nor I ever saw the data until after the results were known. The advisory board is a group of people who are not depletion researchers um, and um, were also just uh, very helpful because this is such a novel method to go, away, uh, go about doing reproducibility. Um, some of the advantages of paradigmatic replication, I've mentioned a few. But when you don't take an existing study from the literature, then you're not hamstrung by what other researchers did. You can create stimuli and, um, and tasks that are bespoke and really kind of fit with the times. So for example, um, this came up even in some of the many labs endeavors where you know, like a study that was published 15 years ago, the stimuli therein may not be appropriate for contemporary times. Um, as mentioned, it doesn't target a particular set of authors. And, uh, and rather shifts the attention back to um, the fidelity of the construct and its reproducibility. 
And, and ideally, we want buy-in from the proponents. I mean, like, uh, I don't know. I see the future of reproducibility ideally being much more about people who have published in an original, uh, as original authors in a literature, feeling empowered, if that's a word, and feeling like they can partake in these uh, replication attempts, or maybe even more at a, uh, a more distal level that they accept the uh, interpretation and conclusion of the project. Okay. Um, Oh, additionally, as Arrington mentioned and a few others, when you don't rely on a particular method that's existing in the literature, you don't have to, um, you don't end up with tussles and you don't end up trying to track down other authors who may not be really willing or reticent or even able to provide you with all the information that you need to conduct your replication study. Because again, with this paradigmatic approach, you're sort of creating the particulars of the method in a bespoke manner. Okay, so what did we actually do? We did a particular form of the paradigmatic replication where we had um, two what we call protocols. So laboratories ran one set of an, one independent variable or independent variable, uh, um, and then other, other labs ran a different set. So there were two protocols, um, and uh, I'll detail those in a, in a second. But the idea here is that by using two forms of the, here are the hypothesis, two different ways to operationalize it, you can maybe assess some, um, some systematic variation in the uh, reproducibility of those methods. Uh, I mentioned that I wasn't uh, that keen on the replication methods that were used by Hager and colleagues, and that was because they were all based in a computer. I study self-control, and I'm very hard-pressed to think of a representative self-control task that is based in the computer. And so uh, our studies use actual behavior. Um, and I think that's uh, sadly being cr crowded out by some of the um, contemporary approaches. And anyways, in short, so we had our participants either crossing out ease, which is the standard task um, that is often used, where you sort of create a habit and then you have people override it, and then after which they tried to work on unsolvable puzzles, and we measured the duration that they spent on it and also the number of tries and attempts that they, um, that they used. And then in a second protocol, we had our participants write a story without using the letters A or N. That's a challenging task. And then participants who are in the control condition, then they write a story uh, just using whatever letters they wish. An independent measure in this task was a cognitive task where participants try to figure out some numerical values, like how many giraffes are there in North America. So you have to sort of use a little bit of guesstimates, um, but also kind of some informed knowledge to bring together a reasonable answer. And then that, those answers are scored according to published norms. As mentioned, we did pre-register our project. We used as predicted. Um, and I think like we're probably, I'm probably taking up way too much of my time. But in short, we had um, 36 labs in three continents and uh, almost 3,600 people. The results show a small effect consistent with the depletion idea and hypothesis, although there was variation. We have meta-analytic approaches, multi-level regression approaches, and Bayesian approaches. So depending on what flavor of statistics you like, they're all going to be there in our article. Um, when I say it's a small effect, it's like on the order of like 0 0.06, 0 0.08. I mean, it's, it's a small effect. Uh, and um, uh, of the two protocols, one descriptively showed bigger effects than the other for the laboratories that use the puzzle tracing task. The sort of top line result was an effect size of about 0 0.18, 0 0.12, depending on what statistics you use. And for that cognitive task that I mentioned, the effect was uh, pretty much a zero effect size. So with that, um, thanks for your attention. And I turn it over to Lisa. So I'm going to use a computer. Um, <clears throat> we were given the option to use slides, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. Uh, and I want to just start by saying um, that, uh, you know, my entire career actually was founded on a series of failures to replicate. So the first eight studies I ever ran, I attempted to replicate published findings. This was back in the 80s, uh, and they didn't replicate. And after eight studies, uh, my choice was to try to figure out what was going on or find another career. You guys aren't laughing, but that, I, uh, I was really ready to kind of leave. Um, and 
so I guess what I want to say is at the outset, uh, just as a preamble, I loved this. I love this meeting. I was um, absolutely captivated yesterday um, by the talks that I heard, and I'm fully supportive of any process which improves the quality of science, the scientific uh, process. That being said, I think, you know, I've been sort of thinking about this panel as like informally the curmudgeon panel. So uh, also uh, I'm known for being somewhat critically minded. Uh, uh, and so that's my job and that's what I'm gonna do here today. When I started graduate school, I took a philosophy of science course. And when I think back on that course, um, it, it leads me to suggest to you that while the replication or replicability crisis is a serious thing, I think of it as a symptom of a larger issue. Um, and so when the news hit uh, that, um, uh, well, I think something that many of us knew, which was that studies were difficult to replicate off in our own, um, I think back to this philosophy of science course that I took. I'd never taken a philosophy of science course before. In fact, I'd never taken a philosophy course before. Um, and I wasn't actually sure why I needed to take it. And I wasn't actually that thrilled to take it. It was one of the first courses I took in graduate school. It was really hard. Uh, but by the end of that course, I pretty much had come to the conclusion, a conclusion that has borne out over all my almost, uh, I guess, 25 plus years of being a scientist, that it was the most important course I ever took. More important, actually, than any statistics course I took, and I took some great statistics courses. I have retrained in four disciplines within psychology over the last 25 years, and philosophy of science has been the most important course, most important knowledge, because if you think about it, we have intuitions and hypotheses. We then have to develop methods to test those hypotheses. Then we measure a bunch of things. We have a bunch of numbers. We have to turn those numbers into some kind of an interpretation or make some kind of inference. Each of those links requires some inference. And you can't really understand what replication means or what a lack of replication means if you don't consider your assumptions and your ontological commitments when you're making those inferences. So in this meeting and in other discussions, we hear a lot about epistemological things. We don't hear so much about ontological things, your assumptions about what exists in the world and how things work in the world. Um, and so in my view, the original framing of the crisis seemed to assume an ontological commitment that I don't hold. And, and I say this because I was asked to be part of the replication uh, initiative, and the way I was asked and what I was asked to do violate some of my own ontological assumptions. So basically, the idea behind the original intent, and I'm not talking about what we now think, but I'm talking about originally, okay, was that you could take any experimental method, test it, put it into any lab, anywhere in the world, at any time of day, on any subject, and you would get the same result. That's what replicability means. To me, what that means is essentialism. Essentialism is the belief that each phenomenon has an essence, a deep immutable cause, which might be influenced by context, but only kind of after the fact, right? Where context is merely a moderator. And in my view, this is an idea that's very old in psychology, but very, very, very wrong, actually. The idea that the mind is a sequence of stable mental states that are caused by uni stable universal processes that you can measure anywhere at any time is just not supported by the evidence, as far as I can see. Um, and this stands, I think, in contrast to the idea that internal, the internal context, your physical state, external spatial context where you are uh, and, and so on um, and who you're with are more than just um, stable mediators, uh, stable moderators of a universal process, but they're actually fundamental aspects of mental events and behaviors. Um, that is, they are fundamental to the brain states that the dynamics brain states that cause our actions and give us our experience. And there's also a temporal context um, that brings you to that state, and that also matters. So a state is not a punctate behavior at a particular point in time. It contains the history that's relevant to getting to that point as well. And so from my perspective, variability is the norm, 
Um, and that's a good thing. And so the example I give people often is blood pressure. If I measure your blood pressure right now, and then I measure blood pressure in 10 minutes from now, the reliability or replicability of that measurement is about 0.5. That's a good thing. If it was higher, it would mean that you were sick. If I take any of you and I test you on a standard working memory task where I ask you to hold something in mind and remember something else, and I test you in, in the morning and I test you in the afternoon, uh, the replicability, uh, you, I, your, your performance will change by about a standard deviation because of circadian rhythm and other types of issues. So that's not evidence of a bug, that's evidence of a feature. Um, and what it means is that there's something about uh, the way that we go about measuring phenomena that um, we have to really consider, I think. And I wrote about this uh, in the New York Times um, after, uh, I think, the first publication in 2015 on the replication crisis. And uh, I was really interested on, you know, that to see that um, for, I was basically excoriated for this, um, this, this op-ed. Uh, where people thought words like context were like weasel words instead of deep insights about the nature of phenomena and the um, complexity of those phenomena. And I thought many things, but one thing I thought was, <laughs> well, so it's okay to be critical about reliability but not about validity? And I also thought, Maybe we should also be willing, people who are criticizing should also be willing to, to, uh, to be criticized. Uh, or at least to be point, pointing out that part of the, they might be missing part of the story. So it wasn't a just so story that I was trying to give. I was trying to actually say there might be actually something really here that we can learn about why things are failing to replicate. Um, and so I just want to make, I just want to give you really one example um, uh, really quickly. You know, since, if you uh, go back to the history of psychology, there's a wonderful book by Kurt Danziger called Naming the Mind, where he describes, the his, he's a historian of psychology, describes where did the categories, where did psychological, Western psychological categories come from? They came from uh, Plato and other um, uh, scholars uh, in, um, in Greek uh, uh, philosophy. <coughs> And at that time, people believed that the human mind was made up of a typology of mental faculties to feel, to think, to see, uh, to perceive. And in the 19th century, with essences, that each, each category had its own essence. So it, uh, it, you sh it should be reproducible uh, and universal. And then in the 19th century, the science of psychology was born when neurologists and, psychologi uh, neurologists and physiologists began searching for the physical basis of these mental categories using a stimulus response method uh, that was um, characteristic of uh, 19th century physiology experiments. And throughout the history of our field, if I had more time, I would go through it with you a little more in depth. We've used, across many different assumptions, uh, we've used this stimulus response method uh, where we randomize our trials, we present a stimulus to a subject, and then we measure the response as if the mind is dormant until you stimulate it with something and then you measure the reaction to that stimulation. And we think we're doing a really good job when we're randomizing things and not letting subjects anticipate what they're going to get. Through many, many paradigms in psychology over 150 years, here's the thing. In the last 20 years, uh, there has been accumulating evidence in neuroscience, in neuroanatomy, in electrical engineering, in uh, metabolics and physiology, that brains, every brain on this planet, doesn't react to anything. It predicts mm -hmm. that there is a continuous, temporally dependent sequence of predictions which are constrained by the, the sense data from the world and from the body, and that's how nervous systems work. And what's really cool about this is that all these literatures were coming to this conclusion uh, not talking to each other. So kind of like independent um, replications in a, in a conceptual sense. Now, of course, people in psychology have criticized the stimulus response idea all the way back to, to John Dewey in the uh, late 1800s. 
Um, and there have been many psychological ideas about perceptual inference and unconscious inference and so on. But I want you to, but no one's really taken it seriously. I just want you to think for two seconds about what this means. So in traditional experiments, there are independent sequences of stimulus and response, which effectively sever the normal contingencies between one moment and the next. Um, and so the brain's predictions, any subject's predictions, are definitely going to be wrong on many trials. In fact, we've, we've designed things that way. Forcing the brain into a mode that favors the processing of prediction errors, when in the real world, the dynamics actually usually favor prediction. Um, and so the standard randomized designs encourage oversampling of what might be considered an unnatural state of the human brain. And we're talking about thousands of experiments. And I'm talking about two decades of my own experiments before I became aware of this literature. OK. Another thing that's important to understand is that when you look at uh, evolutionary and developmental neuroscience, you understand that brains didn't evolve to see and think and feel. That's our interest as scientists, but that's not how brains evolve. Brains evolve to control a body. And if you look at the neuroanatomy, the systems in the brain that are responsible for remembering and seeing and feeling actually are exactly the same systems that control your body, which means that um, you know, it's not just that um, seeing and thinking and feeling evolved in the service of regulating a body. It means that metabolism and energy regulation, not just circulating glucose, but but more broadly speaking, is actually <clears throat> maybe at the heart of all mental activity, which is why testing someone in the morning and testing them in the afternoon might give you actually different results. And so I want you to think about, I, here's what I think about. I think about the fact that I don't ask people how much sleep they got. I don't ask them whether they've had coffee or not unless I'm doing a psychophysiological study. If I'm measuring just behavior, I don't ask. I don't ask them when the last time is they ate. I don't take measures of whether where women are in their menstrual cycles. I don't take measures of how much testosterone someone has at that particular point in the time of day. I just measure their behavior. And even if I'm running a big study, for me, a big study is like 100 people or 200 people, even if that's what my power analysis tells me is sufficient, that means that all that variation in behavior caused by biological variables will be error. And two completely identical uh, um, you know, methods, uh, running the same method twice, can give me very, very different results only on the basis of these biological variables, which actually are um, part of the phenomenon. So I guess my point here is we have to, in addition to all the wonderful things that we're doing, teach, you know, understanding uh, me methods and so on, we have to think about uh, validity in addition to, to reliability. Um, the second thing quickly that I'm going to say is that uh, we aren't doing research in a vacuum. Uh, we've heard today and yesterday about how we're so, we're, you know, we are social animals and we are, ex exist in a social world. And as social animals that exist in a social world, we are motivated by incentives and we have particular incentive structures in our field. Uh, and we, um, have to, um, to think about those incentive structures. And I'm not sure why this says that. I thought I changed my slide, but I guess <laughs> I didn't. Um, OK, well, anyway, so you got the point about uh, reliability. What about validity? Um, I guess the thing that I want to say about incentive structures is there's a lot of discussion here about how to um, prevent people from gaming the system, which is all well and good. But I think we have to actually have a system that just disincents people um, from doing, uh, engaging in bad practices. And currently, we don't have that, um, which I recently wrote a, a column about uh, in The Observer. And then my final point will, today will just be, um, and this is, I'm, now I'm being like slightly provocative here when I say this. If I haven't, I'll been a little more provocative. And that is, I heard the talk yesterday, and I can't, my, my apologies, so I can't remember the name of the person because I'm, you know, I can't remember anybody's name. In fact, if you ask me my name, I'm not really sure I can tell you what it is. Wow, okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it was about polarization in, in science and mistrust. 
And so here's the point that I want to make. Um, at the beginning of the replication crisis, uh, there were a lot of people, there was a lot of polarization. I think there's less polarization now. There was a lot of polarization. And I think partly there was polarization because there was mistrust. And I think there was as much mistrust on the, the receivers of the information as there was on the givers of the information. And what I mean by that is, I actually have always been known in my field as an incredibly critical person, like more critical than uh, uh, maybe is warranted at times. And um, every generation of scientists thinks they're gonna tear down science and rebuild it in, in, in a proper image. Every generation believes this to be true, okay? I'm not saying it isn't true, I'm just saying we all think it. I thought it when I was the young person. At a certain point I realized I'm not the young person anymore, I'm the establishment. That means that you guys out there, who, the young Turks who think that you're like, you know, you're one day gonna be the establishment too. And here's something that took me a long time to learn. If you imply, even unwittingly, that the field is a, a, a cesspool of corruption filled <laughs> with liars and cheaters who are narcissistically motivated by careerism, <laughs> do you know how much people will listen to you, even if you're right? <laughs> Zero, they will zero listen to you, right? Because you've basically insulted, even if you might be right about some bad actors, the entire field can't be indicted on the basis of being bad actors. And I, I think it's a false dichotomy to set up uh, being you know, successful versus being um, moral and righteous. And so I guess my point is that it's better, instead of being if you want to be critical, which I think we all should be, and I, I just want to end by saying I completely agree that, that this uh, discussion of replication, all of these things, as unpleasant as it's been for some people, has been super productive. And it's really heartening to me to see the discussion broaden beyond just replicability, which I think is, and, and really actually start to touch on issues of philosophy and history of science, which I love. Um, I also think that when someone does something that you think is wrong, it's much better to be curious than it is to be judgmental. You might ask yourself, what set of assumptions are they using? What set of beliefs do they have? Why might they have trouble giving up their priors? I mean, just be curious, being curious instead of being judgmental, I think will make this revolution uh, you know, go faster and, and bring more people on board without uh, uh, as much dis distress and, and, and uncomfortableness. That's my final point. Yeah. Right? Yep. <clears throat> here, here. Can I have my slides? Okay. Well, to continue on the theme of the Comachian's comments. <laughs> uh, I agree with Lisa that uh, obviously replication is important. Transparency is important. I also think that there's a whole bunch of things that are often going wrong. So consider these two questions. Does a regimen of 20 milligram of Libidor a, a day reduce cholesterol as a simple uh, question, simplified question versus does being in a positive mood result in more positive evaluations of unrelated objects? In the first case, the variable of interest is essentially the treatment, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that's really the case in psychology. Yeah. In psychology, typically, the things that we're looking at looks quite different. When you ask, does being in a positive mood result in more positive judgments of unrelated stuff, you have many possible treatments. I can put you in a good mood by having you remember something great that happened in your life, by having you find a dime, by having you success, or giving you false feedback on how wonderful you did on a test. I can interview you on the first sunny day of spring uh, instead of a lousy day of ice. Uh, and on and on, right? 
each one of these treatments is not perfect because each one comes with other stuff. If I give you false feedback, you're not only happy, you also think you're smart. If I have you find a dime, you're also lucky, da, 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 da. So none of these treatments is actually the things that you want. What you're really looking for is a convergence between treatments which only share, that they put you in a good mood and hopefully don't overlap too much in all of the other stuff. So here, the treatment is not the conceptual variable. The treatment is something that we use to produce the conceptual variables that we're interested in. Now, what does that mean? Suppose I repeat replication and experiment with one treatment, pick whatever treatment you want, and the original experiment showed an effect of that treatment on the mood as well as an effect on the judgment. And the rest are other outcomes that may happen in now in that no, replications that I'm assuming. Case A, you have an effect on mood and an effect on judgment. You have an effect on mood and no effect on judgment. Pretty clear cut. You have no effect on mood and no effect on judgment. You have no effect on mood and an effect on the judgment, and so on. So what does that mean? Under the treatment perspective, the things that I assume is okay if you're testing whether 20 milligrams of libido does something good on cholesterol. Under the treatment perspective, only case A is a replication. Everything else is a non-replication. And on case E, you can kind of debate about it. So there's nothing on mood, but the final outcome is there, and who knows. And I have seen replications that draw both conclusions on, on that kind of a thing. From the conceptual perspective, the, the situation is much more difficult. From the conceptual perspective, case A is a replication. Case B is a clear non-replication. <coughs> case C and D are simply uninformative. If you forgot, uh, no, case, if, you, if you're not getting a mood effect, I mean, sorry, if you're not managing to induce a mood, then there should not be a mood effect. You could actually say that C and D are perfectly compatible with the theory. If the mood influences judgment and you fail to produce a mood, then you basically had a manipulation that didn't work. If you're interested in the conceptual issue rather than in the robustness of the treatment, that's kind of inconclusive. It behooves you as an experimenter to ensure that you're even inducing the damn independent variables that you want. But many people conclude from this that there's a non-replication as if it were falsification of the hypothesis of the underlying process rather than the failure of, of implementing an effective treatment. And finally, case E and F, I don't know why anybody would even do that. If you forget to measure the mood, yes, your study is freaking silent <laughs> on whether there was a mood effect, but still, no mood effect on the judgment, or we didn't, no, uh, no mood effect on a measure of mood, no attempt to even have a manipulation check, all count as non-replications. People who are actually trying to do research on that conceptual issue are surprisingly not taking it serious, resulting in some Twitter storm that surely, surely uh, something didn't replicate. Anyway, enough said. This cuts both ways. Here's another example. Um, many years ago, I, and I won't go into details, many years ago I did a study where I asked people about their TV consumption on a scale that was constructed in the following way. We used the modal value of TV consumption in that population and <coughs> constructed a scale where that modal value is either the high end of the scale or the low end of the scale. Assuming that when, I, when you now report your behavior on that scale, it tells you something about where you are in the distribution. It suggests different distributions. And the thing of interest was, what does that suggested distribution do to your report and subsequent judgments? The many labs group, I think that was many labs one, many labs group selected that for replication, and we had an interesting exchange. I had done that study in Germany in 1983 with German numbers. At that time, Germans watched two hours a day of television. By the time we talked about the replication in America, 
Americans watched about six hours a day of television, according to Nielsen data, just under that. So I said, look, guys, there's a recipe for how you do this. You construct a scale that takes a modal value in the sample, and then you do that. No, the answer was, we want to replicate the original. So I said, well, but I mean, that's a technical issue, right? If you want to replicate the psychology of the original, you need to use the behavior of your current sample. We didn't agree on that. I suggested, let's do both. I mean, why don't you do a scale with high and low numbers and cross it with using the German numbers from 83 and the American numbers now? End of long story, the group decided to go with the German numbers of 1983 in America in 2000 something. And guess what? The damn thing replicates. The damn thing replicates, and I should probably have been happy, but I'm not happy at all, <laughs> right? Because I'm not happy at all. It replicates with almost the same effect size, which literally means I have to rethink my process assumptions, right? But what I'm after here is there's just no easy way to go from your treatment to the dependent variable if the conceptual thing in between is actually not, if you can't assume that Z is the same. So robustness of a treatment is not the same as robustness of the phenomenon, and it has different implications for the theoretical stuff that you're doing. And I, I think in, in the psychology replications, a lot of what goes wrong, what seems wrong, and why psychology doesn't seem to replicate as well, has to do with that. Just running through the technicalities of the original experiment is not the same as replicating the psychological process that's underlying it. A second issue is what to replicate. Uh, in many replications, it seems to be uh, well, a, a, a choice between the classic study with a high impact or the best study of the phenomenon that you could run 30 years after that classic study. It's not that you haven't learned anything in the last 30 years. But nevertheless, the choice often seems to be to run the classic study. If you're interested in learning about the phenomenon, you probably would want the study that is informed by what we now know. If there are known moderators, running the replication without those moderators is kind of silly. The only context in which that makes sense is when you go back to those incentives which you have correctly identified for the original researchers. Careers benefit from novel findings that attract attention. Minor tweaks and so on don't work. And this influences how we do original research and there's no doubt about it. But the same holds for replication research. And when I look at the choices made, when I look at why would you want to go for the best known study, rather than the best study you can now do, which is what you know, Kathleen was doing in the prototypical thing, taking together what do we now know about the phenomenon, what can the community of scientists working on this agree as being the best thing we can do at that point. And that's what we want to replicate in many labs, and that's what we want to find out how robust it is. Instead, often you go for the best known study because it gives you the biggest bang when it bumps. But you don't learn the most when it bumps. Because a lot of why it bumps, you could already have learned by just reading the literature. And if one had read the literature, and if the replicators were actually working, doing research in the area in which they replicate, a lot of failures would not happen. An example for that is a facial feedback study. For the non-psychologist, I won't go there. It's a study in which everybody who worked in the area would say, they did what? They wanted to make sure that you're moving your face properly by sticking a video camera in your face recording you. Anybody who's been around in the 1970s <laughs> and has worked on emotion knows that when I stick a video camera in your face, that is changing the process. So it's a follow-up to that multi-lab non-replication, which manipulated exactly that. It's an Israeli group, and the paper is entitled when both the original and the non-replication replicate. The original replicates without the video camera. That was not in the original. 
And the non-replication replicates when you put the video camera into people's face. Mm -hmm. I think that would not have happened if the people who run the replication are actually people working in that area rather than guided by the principle that Lisa summarized, that somehow you can just take this stuff and do whatever, and if you go through some of the mechanics, it will all be fine. And context doesn't play a role. So, do I have another minute? One, okay. Uh, and I felt that I, I saw a bit of the same ambivalence and of the same kind of ambivalence induced by incentives when I heard over the last few days how people talked about non-replication rates. On the one hand, everybody said, you know, we really shouldn't focus on rates of non-replication. It's really not that informative. Of course, you're all now way more quantitatively sophisticated than most experimenters of my generation. And you really know that uh, you would need a representative sample. But shortly after having said, we shouldn't really focus on that, everybody's happy to repeat how little replicates. And I'm kind of confident, listening to Tim Arrington, that we will see the same thing. So Tim told us that there was a systematic sample of 197 experiments that they hoped to replicate, of which they actually managed to complete 52, which is a heroic effort. And I'm confident that once a report comes out, the headline of almost every report about that enterprise will be that only X percent of preclinical cancer research replicates. Even so, it's X percent, <coughs> 52 studies, who, who knows what they represent of preclinical cancer research. But again, the incentives, if you want to make sure that you get funding for the enterprise, then of course you have to convince people that there's a big problem. And many of the choices made in the selection of replications, in the way you talk about replications and so on, seems more geared toward convincing funders that there's a big problem that needs funding than in actually learning something about the phenomenon. Now, I'm sure you will find that unfair. And yes, it is unfair. <laughs> it is unfair if you think that I talked about your bad intentions personally. I did not. I talked about the system. And if you still find it unfair, be assured the original researchers know that feeling. <laughs> Their response to listening to you talking about incentives, where you basically implicitly say that everybody's out there deliberately cheating. And if I take the same perspective, then I end up saying, yes, the way you select, the way you report replications is not good science. Thanks. Thank you. Whoa. Any slides? <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, that's a hard act to follow. Uh, can you throw gasoline on a fire? <laughs> I'm gonna try. Uh, can, can I have my slides? But I, 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 think, I think you heard me the way many of us Yeah. Is there a break right after? <laughs> yes, there is. People can recover. Go right yeah, in. okay, that's good. Uh, okay, so I, I'm a true fish out of water here. And, and thanks to John for the invitation. This has been a fantastic conference for me. This is something I would never, ever attend on my own volition. And uh, <laughs> I'm actually, I'm basically the experimental animal that you guys study, right? I, at least if you're going to study basic research. I'm a, I'm a basic researcher. I have an MD, but I never did any clinical research. I, I hated medicine. I love research. And um, I'm going to talk about how the, what you're worried about, where, where I see the concern, doesn't really apply in many ways to, to my work in my field, which is biomedical, basic biomedical research. Uh, and you can see from my title. Uh, to me, this is a tremendous waste of time and probably very counterproductive. So disclaimers. I do work for the federal government. Uh, but what follows are my personal opinions. Uh, I work uh, not in the, on the branch of the um, NIH where you would give the money out. I work in the branch where we just get the money. Uh, and this is a, a way better career in terms of how we fund research to have to apply for grants than just rather do research. Every four or five years, people review you. Uh, if you're productive, they say, good, lab is the same size. You're not getting any bigger, any smaller. And basically, this is the plan of the intramural program, and there is no reason this can't be grafted uh, 
everywhere in the world, including in the United States. Um, it's a much better way to do research. Uh, and uh, I had nothing to do with the Alabama weather forecast. I just uh, reassure you. Point one, so I think I'm gonna make five points if I remember correctly. Uh, expertise counts, hugely counts in experimental science. Failure to reproduce does not equal reproducibility. It could, it may not. Uh, many experiments require a high degree of skills and, and expertise. Uh, they often take months or years uh, to perfect. Uh, and like everything else, experimental skill is not evenly distributed between individuals. This is Art Tatum, the world's greatest, probably, jazz pianist, and nobody could play like he did. And I've had people in my lab who can do experiments, and <clears throat> I, we're always worried about fraud and, and irreproducibility. This is the ethos of a, of a good biomedical research lab. And I'm always seeing the raw data. And, <clears throat> and particularly things we discover, the best things we discover, nobody could have predicted. Okay, so the person had no incentive in finding it. They didn't know what to find. And uh, sometimes they don't even know what it means, right? They're junior scientists, and I, I feel most comfortable when that happens, actually. Because right? I know, they, they don't know this could be a great finding. Okay, so uh, you have a group of people who are saying, oh, I'm going to replicate the work of the Udell lab. Uh, they can't do it. Okay, so, so maybe we got it wrong. Or maybe they just didn't do it right. And I've had a number of findings in my lab where really good people made the findings, and it took them a long time. And it's like, okay, well, let's extend this work. Uh, people try to do it, they, they can't do it. And I look at what they're doing, and I can see mm, they're, they're not quite up to snuff often. And I never say that, of course, right? And I never want to give negative feedback like that. But I'm not convinced by their failure to, to replicate. Uh, these people never believe you that the original work was, was replicable, but I've had several examples where, where people couldn't replicate the work, and then people came later, and they could. And actually, our most cited paper, um, uh, people came after, could not replicate, was found, and this was highly ironic, because the replication had occurred but 20 years earlier, because it was a, a very obscure paper, did the same thing, and people at that time weren't interested, and I missed it in the literature. Okay, so just because you can't do something doesn't mean it's wrong. Okay, so if you have a, a group that's gonna to try to replicate research, I am highly skeptical about failures. And, and that first paper that came out from the Andrew group, and this was, this was the very definition of chutzpah. Um, well, we, we can't replicate these studies, but we're not gonna tell you what they were, and we're not gonna tell you how, how we did it. That's, that's meaningless. That, that's malpractice by the journal editor who, who published that. And that's one of the things that got the whole crisis going. Right? And so maybe it's right or maybe it's wrong, but that is irresponsible. Point two. John told me not to hold back. Right? <laughs> this is good, right? I, 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 yeah, yeah, this is good. Go. Okay. This yeah. Is... So <laughs> the biggest problem in experimental biology is not irreproducibility, it's misinterpretation, typically based on experimental artifacts that have not been controlled for. That's usually what the problem is. So here's my favorite example of the essentiality of controls. Uh, probably my favorite paper of all times. 1945, Journal of Experimental Medicine. These three guys doing this very obscure work on how uh, pneumococcus goes from one form that's easy to see in a microscope versus another. Okay, it's, it's called uh, From Rough to Smooth, the Colonies, because they have a, a genetic change. And, you know, it's just like this kind of thing that, you know, when a, a, a congressman would go, why are we wasting money on this research, right? And so they had this change. And based on a series of, uh, of serendipitous observations, they knew they could cause this change by making an extract from a cell that had this property and transfer it to the cell that didn't have this property. Okay, so they called it the transforming factor. Okay, so what did the transforming factor turn out to be? Anyone know? DNA, DNA. This was the first experiment to show directly that DNA was a genetic material. And perhaps the most, experiment, most important experiment ever done in molecular biology. Okay, uh, they could have repeated their experiment ad infinitum with purified DNA and achieved p-values of infinitesimally small numbers. Okay, and you guys would be very happy, I guess, because it's reproducible. But this would be meaningless if the DNA was contaminated with another substance that was actually doing the transformation, like a protein. 
Okay, so they did perhaps one of the greatest controls of all time, my favorite one. Don't worry about the details. They did this very clever thing where they had, at that time, it was very primitive in, in cell and molecular biology, but they had enzymes of pretty well-defined specificity. So what they could show was that if they took a protease, didn't kill the activity. If they took a lipidase, didn't kill the activity. If they took DNAs, killed the activity. Did that prove it was DNA? Of, of course not. I hope none of you is under uh, the false impression that we can prove anything in science, because as a philosopher, you know we cannot prove anything. We make observations that we interpret, and at some point, we agree they're likely to be true. There are some things that, that can be kind of proven, like a mouse that's dead is dead, okay? <laughs> Schrodinger's cat is dead, okay? So that we can kind of prove. But everything else, it's just we're negotiating with the truth. The truth is an asymptotically distant thing that we're trying to approach, okay? And that's got to be your attitude in every field of science. Okay, it's not just a cliche. Science really is self-correcting, right? I, I, maybe in your field, it's not so rapidly self-correcting. But <laughs> if a finding is interesting and important, other labs will rapidly build on the results or debunk them. We, we, we never try to completely replicate something. That would be a waste of my time. I, I take a finding and it's like, okay, we, let's make that assumption, now let's try to extend it. Okay, the most famous example maybe in recent times, uh, cold fusion, right? A huge thing, cold fusion, we're gonna solve the energy crisis, we're gonna solve global warming, big deal, right? 1989, huge deal. Uh, this was corrected within a few months, right? And it actually has made a cottage industry for you guys. Uh, if you go to Amazon, what's that number there? 100 and, how was it, 60 something? 160 books on how everything got screwed up. Okay, but it, it was corrected immediately because it was super duper important. If I publish a paper in, uh, in Nature next week that I've got the cure for uh, B cell lymphoma, uh, people are gonna be really interested and within a year, we're gonna know if that's reproducible or not. Okay, and they're not gonna do exactly what I did. Okay. You're thinking, well, how often does that happen? So I, I uh, sitting there yesterday listening to talks, I went through my own CV, right? And I picked out, I have about 200 papers from my lab that are really from my lab that are original research uh, projects, okay? Over the course of my career. So I went through that and I asked my, I just, my own judgment, how many of those basically were we correcting erroneous conclusions from other publications? And the answer was 15 out of 200, about 7%. So this goes on all of the time, okay? And this was an art, in none of these uh, experiments was our intention to disprove something else. It was just like, oh, this is interesting. Let's use that. And then you, you're doing the experiments like, oh, I don't think they're right. Okay, so this, this correction goes on all the time uh, in, in experimental science. Point four, something can be wrong and still be incredibly useful, right? Um, this is what I tell students. I mean, we, the way we teach our students to read papers, I can't believe any of them stay in science because we, we teach them in journal clubs that every paper is the worst paper ever, ever published. <laughs> like we tear down the papers. This experiment is wrong. That's wrong. They had the wrong detergent. They had the wrong salt. I mean, it's very depressing, right? And, and we completely miss the fact that the papers are cool and the findings are interesting. So w when I'm reading papers and even reviewing papers, to be honest, as I get older and much lazier, I, I'm not, I, I figure the truth is that's the problem of the authors. Right? I'm a selfish person. John can attest to this. And I'm only interested in, in shit that's useful to me. And if there's an interesting idea there, that, that's what I'm interested in. And if the data are wrong, okay, whatever. Right? So uh, here's the thing. We, we scientists in the lab, you know, if we're well-trained, we don't believe anything. That's true. Okay? I mean, so nothing's a fact. We're really skeptical about everything, and, and particularly if we're good and honest, the, the stuff we publish, we're always questioning this, waking up in the middle of the night worrying about that one experiment. Is that really right? Okay, so, you know, there's this misconception, certainly in the public, that we prove things and we move from thing to thing and we never re-examine, that's just bullshit, right? And, and when you write a, a textbook chapter, uh, many of you have, you know, young people not yet, but uh, the way I write it, you know, the stuff I know, I have to completely oversimplify because I don't have room. So I have to, it might not lie, but you know, it's not completely right. There's this exception, that exception. And then the other stuff you write about, you hold your nose because you read the papers and you think, oh my God, that's what we think based on that? But you, it's a textbook. You have to say, this is what we know now, right? So knowledge is always conditional. 
So here, here's the problem, according to me. The, the problem is the overly competitive system of rewards and incentives that we basically could have designed to bring out the worst in people. Yeah, I like this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you guys got it. I, I, I don't think anyone ever laughed at that before, so good for you. So competition, it's essential for the scientific process. It's a crucial part of it. You, can, you can't do without it. But too much is obviously malignant, right? Uh, and what we've done in biomedical research is your career is on the line with every grant funding mm -hmm. publication. Get this paper as a postdoc, you're probably going to get a job offer. Don't get it, or it's in a lesser journal. You're not. This is just, this is just not good. A and it's not just postdocs getting uh, jobs or tenure track scientists. It's everybody. This is, we've, we've created a career that's incredibly competitive, where people are working 60 or 70 hours for one-tenth of what they would make in the finance industry, even though they have the same brains. And they're not like a respected lawyer or doctor, where you're always going to have a practice and a career. You can lose your career. I just, uh, yesterday I had lunch with a, a friend of mine at Stanford, a fantastic scientist, world class. You know, some idiot on a study section or two didn't give him a grant, and all of a sudden he he's, doesn't have a grant, and Stanford's like, uh, yeah, you know, uh, I think time may be up here. Right, so who are the culprits? The culprits. Universities have lost sight of their mission. Uh, the publication process, I could go on for an hour about that. Uh, I, I feel like I should be Martin Luther in the door of nature, science, and cell, and, and, and my 95 theses or whatever it was, right? The project-based grant system adjudicated by a committee, mainly now of young people who are afraid to really voice a strong opinion in a committee. And what I've seen about committees, you'll take very reasonable people one-on-one, -on -one, put them in a committee, and they're just idiots. Uh, this NIH emphasis on immediate clinical impact. Everything we do has tomorrow, it's got to be a treatment. That's not the way science works. It's not the way research works. We have 500 years of research experience to know this is true, right? That, that findings in one field may take decades, centuries to apply to all of humanity. And uh, a truth that has never changed is that knowing something about science, about nature, is always useful, right? And some of the most important things are going to take a long time. And if you put everybody on what looks immediately important, you're going to miss a lot of big things, and it's just take humanity a lot longer time to get there. What is a university? It's a business park. What is a scientist now? It is an entrepreneur. Graduate students, postdocs, in my field, cheap labor. Uh, extremely intelligent and hardworking individuals must struggle to maintain a career that serves the public good. Uh, we put kids six years to graduate school. It's free, which is good. We pay them less than they would have gotten had they gone into the workforce right out of college. And these are kids who are going to have to work 60, 70 hours a week. What, what are we doing? We don't pay them any kind of pension benefits. We don't even pay them Social Security, believe it or not. Right? So this is an unsustainable system that minimizes satisfaction, happiness, and foments malpractice. It's in PowerPoint. You just have to look. Uh, <laughs> what are the solutions? Uh, okay, you know, I am a, I am a, sometimes I'm a, a, a cockeyed optimist, as John will tell you. Restore academic values at universities. Good luck with that one. Uh, don't value faculty based solely on the ability to raise money. What about teaching? What about integrity? What about mentorship? What about collegiality? Right? What about seeking the truth? Uh, remove financial career incentives for increasing institution size. NIH gets more money. Every dean in the country in medical school, their eyes bug out. Oh, we got we to build. Holes appear in the ground at Stanford, Harvard, Penn, right? Have a national policy to match the number of PIs with the NIH budget to allow a reasonable amount of competition. Require NIH-funded institutes, institutes to pay at least half or more of faculty member salary. Summary, reproducibility fraud crisis in biomedical research is a minor sy symptom of a serious chronic disease. Treating the symptom of reproducibility is essentially a cover your ass procedure that placates the press and public without dealing with the serious structural issues and without threatening the powers that be, which are basically the universities. Okay, so uh, this is my book. It's actually Truth Wins. Uh, the early version you saw had a different title. Uh, this is free to anybody. That was the world population as of Friday. Uh, 
And if you just email it to me, I will send you a link to a, a Google folder and you can uh, download it. Uh, there's also um, on my email, there's a link to a talk I gave at Ohio State a few years ago. They have this uh, Science Sunday. You ever hear of these? They're fantastic talks for the general public where I, I, I talk about the importance of science, the scientific method, how critical, critical it is for, for society. Um, so that's, that's it, and we're at zero. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Go. So uh, in closing, let me say, I, I think you should buttonhole John at lunch, because what he didn't get to talk about is um, what, what I was hoping he would eventually get to, which is that he steadfastly refuses <clears throat> to randomly assign the participants in his experiments to experimental conditions. The uh, participants being mice. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and cells. <laughs> so, uh, and we can talk about that. Yes, exactly. Yes. So uh, on that note, I think it's been a great session to hear uh, some perspectives, I think, on a lot of the evidence we've been hearing the last few days. And I hope you enjoy the break. And then we will be back for one more discussion with uh, journalists. See you then. Mm, that was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs>